So for those that don't know me, my name is Wes Everman. I'm an extension weed specialist in soybeans and small grains. And gonna be talking to you a little bit about some of the resistance we're seeing, some of the weed management concerns we have, and just some general um, weed management practices we've got going on. So first off, I'm gonna get talking a bit about um, some of the resistance we're seeing in the state. Okay, so um, everybody knows we got the Palmer concerns. We're seeing more and more of the PPO resistance start to pop up across the coastal plain, spreading out to the eastern part of the state. We're seeing what we believe is a bit of PPO resistance north of the sound. So it is in this region, so be prepared. Uh, so a lot of that is gonna be glyphosate, ALS, and PPO resistant, okay? So three-way resistant in a regular Roundup Ready or conventional bean, we don't have any uh, options for post-emergence control. So we need to be incorporating residuals in there. We need to be proactive in our management. Now, if you look at uh, Liberty, Dicamba, or 2,4-D beans, we can still control the Palmer Amaranth there. They're effective, but we need to be very timely, right? We gotta be there early and not wait until they get too much size on us. The next one I'm gonna talk about is ragweed, common ragweed, right? So it's a little bit more of an issue for you folks in this part of the state than the rest of the state. You guys had glyphosate resistance early on. Um, we're seeing more of that glyphosate resistant ragweed. A lot of it is also ALS resistant and we've also confirmed three-way resistance, right? So we got glyphosate, ALS, and PPO resistant common ragweed in the eastern part of the state here. And again, we found this initially in just a few fields, but now it's starting to spread regionally uh, up here in the, as well as the northeast, okay? So again, you don't have very good post-emergence options. Liberty, Dicamba 2,4-D will work. Liberty is better on the common ragweed than it is on the Palmer amaranth. I mean, you get control with both on both weeds with it, but you can let that ragweed get a little bit bigger and still get control. Um, as far as other challenges, we don't have good pre-emergence products for that ragweed. That's the big challenge. We're trying to develop some recommendations for metribuzin. We're gonna be doing some screens on the soybean OVT varieties this fall in the greenhouse. So hopefully this winter we'll have some fact sheets we can hand out as you're planning your soybean program to be able to say, okay, I've got bad ragweed in these fields. I'm gonna plant a metribuse intolerant variety and go from there. Now, horseweed continues to be a big challenge across the state, glyphosate, ALS resistance, um, I, I don't think there's a whole lot new there. Big thing is get them when they're small, make sure they're not bolting, uh, you know, getting some size to them six to eight inches tall, we start losing some control. So try to stay on top of them early, okay? Any questions about resistant weeds? The ones we've been fighting. I do wanna mention a little bit about uh, water hemp. So we've been finding this throughout the state now. Um, we found the first ones probably in 2015, I believe, 2014, 2015. Again, they were just isolated populations, but once I started talking about them at field days and uh, winter meetings, we've been finding more and more populations. Right now, we've got confirmed three-way resistant uh, water hemp, glyphosate, ALS, and PPO, and we're pretty much down the path of confirming HPPD resistance. Okay, so we're probably gonna have a four-way resistant pigweed in the state uh, once we finish this confirmation process. We're gonna test some other modes of action afterwards. We believe this was transported in on equipment uh, at some point, probably from the Midwest. And out there, they've got up to six-way resistant uh, Palmer Amaranth. So they've got stuff that's resistant to the group 15s, so dual harness, uh, warrant, Zidua, Outlook, uh, resistant to 2,4-D, resistant to Roundup, ALS, PPO, Atrazine, and did I say the HPPDs? I'm gonna get DNAs. I mean, they've got resistance out the wazoo. Um, so hopefully we didn't 
bring in one of those really, really bad ones. Four way is bad enough, but hopefully it's just stopping at four. All right. Any questions at this point? So I'm going to talk a bit here about different programs. How many folks here are growing conventional soybeans at all? Anybody out this way? I've been getting more and more calls this year about conventional beans. You know, folks getting into some programs where they get a premium on conventional beans or maybe seed growers. And what we're seeing is a resurgence of a, an old enemy. Who can tell me what this is right here? Sickle pod, right? This used to be a huge issue, right? This was our biggest challenge before we had Roundup and Roundup ready crops. We did a good job controlling it. Now we're seeing fields start to look like this again, or at least patches of fields, right? Sickle pod is starting to make a bit of a resurgence. When we try to control it, Roundup still works, Liberty will work, Dicamba 24D, you know, they'll all work if you get them small. But in conventional beans, we don't have great options, right? So a lot of folks switched over to conventional programs, trying to get a premium, and ended up seeing sickle pod come in. This is the size that we need to spray the sickle pod, right? Right up here on top, cotyledon to first leaf is where we need to be spraying these weeds to get acceptable control. And that's spraying with classic or first rate. Those two products are the only ones that are going to give us acceptable post-emergence control. All right? So we need to be out there timely. This guy right down here, you're looking at two to three leaves. That's too big to get acceptable control. You might get a few of them. You might get pretty good control. But it's not going to be what you want to see, right? So be aware of that. Be prepared if you're going to a conventional program or you have sickle pod as a concern. I've been seeing a lot of fields with this situation right here. Okay. This image on the left is a pretty good sized sickle pod. That's about the time we notice it and say, gosh, I better spray those, right? If you spray this at this stage, that's what you're going to have. How many of you guys think that this is going to die? Anybody? No, right? You got some green growth coming back here. It's just going to sucker back, and it's going to be there at the end of the season. All right? So we've got to make sure we're timely, we're getting out there early, and we're managing it when we should be. All right, and I should mention... For anybody interested in conventional programs, I've got some handouts up here on broadleaf and grass products and which ones are effective and not for different species of weeds, okay? So if you want it, come on up and grab one. Um, I didn't bother handing it out because I didn't want people just throwing them around and losing them in the truck if you don't care. So, <laughs> all right. Any questions on the conventional beans or sickle pod? All right, I'm going to get into the next topic here. All right, folks, if you can see this, what's going on here? What is that? Dicamba. Pretty easy to see, right? Pretty clear what's going on. Well, for those that don't know, you see this cupping going on, right? That leaf margin cupped up, a little bit of uh, puckering within the leaf, right? So you can pick those cupping beans out real easy. About 60 mile an hour, you can pick it, out, pick it up on the road, right? All right, what's going on here? I heard a 2,4-D. Any other ideas? Hmm? Oh, these guys want to see. What do you got? 2,4-D, you think? This is also dicamba. It, squint at it hard because there's a lot of different leaf shapes and a lot of things going on when we see dicamba, uh, especially off target movement, right? I got another one for you. How about this one? 
I was 100% sure I knew what this one was. Huh? <laughs> what? He's scared to say now. <laughs> Look, I'll, I'll say, I just saw this last week. I was 100% sure, 100% in my professional opinion, that this was 24D. The more we investigated, the more we looked, and then looked back at the data that we have from studies we did with low rates of dicamba at different timing on beans, if they're in re reproductive stage at a fairly high dose, this is dicamba injury. Okay? To me, this looks a lot like 2,4-D. That leaf is stretched out, it's strapped, it's got epinasty. This is usually what we use as a key to tell the difference between 2,4-D and dicamba. So be aware that we can be fooled based on what's going on. So we need all the factors before we make a determination about what is there. Any questions about that? All right, I got another one for you. Actually, I'm going to change my order. All right, what's going on here? This one's a little safer, right? Dicamba? A little bit of dicamba there. Just a little whiff. I'll show these guys again. A little bit of dicamba there. Pretty easy to see, okay? The question is, where did it come from? So that soybean leaf came from right here, uh, right where I'm standing when I took this picture. All right? The dicamba was applied way back here. I'm going to zoom in for you. <laughs> so I zoomed in tight way back here, about a mile and a half away, is where that dicamba was sprayed from. OK? way back here. That mile and a half was all injured soybeans, okay? All, um, it was a gradient, it was wind drift. Now the applicator, he was spraying when the wind on average was four to eight miles an hour, when he should be, right? This is a on-label application. Until you look at what was going on with the wind gusts the wind gusts were getting upwards of 18 miles an hour, okay? An 18 mile an hour wind gust can push this herbicide upwards of a mile, well, that wasn't the end of, I mean, that was the end of the soybeans. There were no soybeans beyond where we were. I don't know how much further it would have gone, but we saw dicamba injury a mile and a half from where those beans were applied, where we had an 18 mile an hour wind gust. So think about that, fellas. It's real easy to say, well, the wind's holding four to eight. I'm good and going. But Charlie and I talk about this in the stewardship meetings, right? We got to watch the wind gusts. They're going to push a lot farther than we expect. That herbicide can carry a long way. And it's going to make us think it came from somewhere else. There will be a lot of talk about volatility. This is why I think these herbicides get the reputation of getting up and walking on us, right? They're not really getting up and walking. They just float a lot further than we ever think they would. And soybeans are a very sensitive indicator species, okay? So just be aware that this drift can be happening and is happening oftentimes when we don't even realize it. Okay. You guys got any questions about this? No questions? Everybody's in a food coma after all the shrimp and chicken? <laughs> I understand. It's hot. It's nice under the tent. I think I'm, am I good on time? Ready to hand off to you? Jason Ward is going to come up. He's our precision, what is, well, I'll let you do your official title. He, he's our new precision ag guy. 